Well, it's nice that you come. Um, I realize we're nowhere near come follow me, but oh well. That's how it is. Uh, we're still back in Matthew 5. Um, oh, one, one quote I wanted to give you for uh, where Jesus says to leave your gift at the altar. Don't be angry with your brother. Uh, and especially don't come to the temple if you're angry. Uh, instead, uh, leave your gift and be reconciled. And I found it interesting that it says something very much the same in the Talmud. And one thing to consider, and this is an idea that really didn't get investigated by scholars until the 1970s and 80s. I thought it was much sooner, but looking at um, rabbinical Judaism as developing at the same time as Christianity, because rabbinical Judaism, as we understand it today, is quite different from temple Judaism. And they had to come up with, the rabbis had to come up with some way to be Jewish in the absence of a temple when the Romans destroyed the temple. And that changed all of the power structure. You no longer had a king. You no longer had any use for the Sadducees who were supportive of the temple. You didn't have anything for the priests to be doing because the temple is gone. Who's going to be the leaders of the people? And how do they lead? And how do you worship God? in the absence of a temple. And that is an issue that both the Christians and the Jews were thinking about at the time that uh, they were forming in that first and second century AD. So some of rabbinical Judaism is not very descriptive of pre-Christian Judaism. Um, uh, many people will take something like the um, entire Passover Seder as you can buy the little books, you know, the Haggadah, and it tells you to drink the first cup here and then the second cup and say this and read that. And I try to explain to people that that did not exist at the time of Jesus. That's a medieval construction and you're welcome to do it. But to say that they were drinking such and such a cup when this happened at the Last Supper is anachronistic, okay? And stepping back and saying, hmm, what did Jews believe at the time of Jesus rather than what did Jews believe today or what did Jews believe at the time of Abraham, right? There weren't Jews at the time of Abraham. That's the name of his grandson. They were Hebrews at the time of Abraham. And you can get to be a stickler over that. Anyway, this is the comment from the Talmud, which I really like. Yom Kippur, and you'll remember that's the Day of Atonement, the day on which the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and obtain forgiveness for the sins of everyone. Um, now Yom Kippur is a day of fasting and prayer, but there is no Holy of Holies to, for the high priest to go into. So that's one of the things that's been changed. But they still, that is the high holy day of the year. Yom Kippur atones for a person's transgressions against God, but it does not atone for his transgressions against his fellow man until he appeases those he has sinned against. So you need to make peace with, you need to be reconciled with, you need to make reparations for your sins against other people. You can't just pray to God and say, forgive me if you haven't fixed the problem. And that's what Jesus was saying and what the rabbis will later say. You can come and take the sacrament every Sunday, but if you have a major issue with somebody else or have 
extorted funds or, you know, <laughs> as happens, uh, or anything else that is illegal or unethical, you need to take care of that before you come to the altar, right? Whatever form the altar takes in your life now. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, where Jesus says, you have heard it said of old, but I say unto you. And when I started reading that, I got thinking, wait a minute. This isn't what the Old Testament says. Um, he's quoting things that are not in the Old Testament. And that's what I started with. And I wrote down a couple of comments. Either the Gospels are misquoting Jesus, either or translation misquoting Jesus, or the Jews he's quoting are misquoting the Bible. And I really think it's the second of those. Uh, let's look at, at what happens here. Um, this is from a blog post by a guy named Peter Kroll. And I liked what he had to say. And in Matthew 5, verse 19, it says, Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoso shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And that, I, my mind went immediately to Abinadi and the priests of King Noah, who claim that they are teaching the people the law of Moses and that they need to live the law of Moses, which is these Ten Commandments Jesus is going through in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so I would have you turn to Messiah chapter 12, where they um, have, have brought Abinadi. You know, he hides first. He criticizes uh, King Noah, and then he goes into hiding. And then he comes back, and he comes in disguise. This is a piece of humor in the Book of Mormon, in my opinion. He came in disguise among the people, and they knew him not. And he began to prophesy and said, thus saith the Lord, thus hath the Lord commanded me, Abinadi, go preach. And it's like, really? You go in disguise and then you immediately tell them who you are. That, that's been reported oddly. Okay, so um, he's hauled in before the king and the priests. And the first thing that they do is ask him, what does this verse from Isaiah mean? Right, because like everyone else, they are not quite sure what Isaiah is saying. Um, and Abinadi's response, verse 25 of chapter 12. Now Abinadi said unto them, are you priests and pretend to teach this people and to understand the spirit of prophesying and yet desire to know of me what these things mean? I see unto you, woe unto you, and that's exactly the language of Luke as he reports on the Sermon on the Mount, which is called the Sermon on the Plain in the book of Luke. He does the blessed, 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 and curse, curse, curse. And woe means cursed. Uh, woe be unto you for perverting the way of the Lord. For if you understand these things, you have not taught them. Therefore, you have perverted the way of the Lord. You have not applied your heart to understanding. You have not been wise. Therefore, what are you teaching this people? Can you see the play on a wise man builds his house on the rock and the foolish man builds on the sand? It's the same conversation going on here. And then they claim, we teach the law of Moses. And Abinadi's response to that one is, if you teach the law of Moses, why do you not keep it? And that's exactly, I think, what is going on here with Jesus speaking to the Jews about the things they have been taught, what they have heard. You have heard it said, is, is what he'll start out with. Um, and. Um, I wanted to give you an idea of, of Abinadi. 
I believe that Ed is what's at the end of his name, which is the Hebrew word for witness. And, um, okay, I think his name is Aben Ed E, instead of Abinadi, Abinadi. And I say that pronunciation because there's the Ed, and Eben is Ab plus Ben. So that's father and son. Eben is the rock you're to build on if you're a wise person. And the rock is that the father has a son. That's the thing you build your foundation upon, that the son is the son of the father. And Abinadi witnesses to that in a court of law and will be killed for that. I did not realize until this time reading through that witness in Greek is the word martyr. Abinadi is the witness. He speaks of how Jesus is both the father and the son and how you should actually live the law of Moses. Uh, let me show you a couple of other Hebrew words that relate to witness, uh, which is ed. You have uh, what they uh, edot, which is the plural, feminine plural, and that's describing the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the witness or the testimony. And I think it's called that because of what's inside. Inside are the Ten Commandments on the tablets, the second set, uh, Aaron's rod that rooted, branched, blossomed with almonds, uh, and a pot of manna. And I think that it's witnessing to how God has communicated with us and how he cares for us and, and is helping us. The Tabernacle of Congregation, which is one of the names for the tabernacle, is the Moed. And that means you take the word witness and put an M in front of it. And so it's kind of like a group of witnesses or a place where you bear your testimony or a place where you get a testimony. Because witness is also the word for testimony. So we could call, when we get up and bear our testimony, it's um, this phrase, moed. Um, um, ud is the verb to witness uh, that, that the noun witness comes from. But I thought that was really fascinating that that's also martyr and ties in so well with Mosiah. Um, let, let me read a couple of verses from chapter 13 as well, starting at verse 25, where he's just gone through, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness. And by the way, the word witness there is owed or ed. Don't witness is, is what the, um, is on the, ten, in the Ten Commandments. Um, don't covet. And it came to pass that after Abinadi said, made an end of saying these things, he said unto them, have you taught this people that they should observe to do, to keep, to do all these things to keep these commandments? And when you say keep the commandments, you're saying shomer, which is to guard. Because the keep in a castle is the most guarded place. It's where you put your most precious things, your wife and your kids, to protect them in an attack. It's, it's just like Jacob coming in to the promised land bringing his family with him. First he sends the goats and the sheep and the servants, and then, this isn't very nice, but then he sends the handmaidens and their kids, and then he sends Leah and her kids, 
And the very last thing that would get attacked by Esau, if he's angry still and is going to try and kill people, is Rachel and Joseph and Benjamin. That's what he values most. That's what's in his keep, to keep and guard. So when we're told to keep the commandments, it means make these the things you care about most. And so it is always fascinating to me when I start reading evangelical stuff that says, you just need to say, Lord, Lord, and you'll be saved in the kingdom of heaven. People were saying that back in Jesus' day. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. You got to do this stuff. Uh, it's, it's not a matter of just words. Now, you have said that salvation cometh by the law of Moses, and I say unto you, it is expedient that you should keep the law of Moses. But the time will come when you don't need the rest of the law, salvation does not come by law alone, were it not for the atonement which God himself makes for sins, we would otherwise perish. Now, what you find among uh, religious people then is two extremes of believing that if you obey every little niggling rule of the law, you'll be saved. And then at the other end, you just call on the name of Jesus and you'll be saved. And what Jesus and Abinadi are actually saying is, well, it's actually kind of in the middle. You got to keep the commandments, but you also have to rely on the mercy of the Lord. Okay. And that's kind of where he's going to go with uh, how we interpret these. He's going to say, uh, you shall not kill. I say, don't even get angry. Uh, you shall not commit adultery. I say unto you, he that looketh upon a woman in order to lust after her hath committed adultery in his heart. You shall not swear. Now you should think, what does it mean by swearing? Now it is not a good idea to use the Lord's name or to use foul language. But that is not what this is talking about. This commandment is don't take the name in vain, meaning don't make a covenant you don't intend to keep. Because when you get baptized or partake of the sacrament, you are taking his name upon you. And if you have no intention of doing what he's asked you to do, then don't take his name in vain. Right? Um, yeah, you shouldn't swear, but at the same time. Now, the, when he goes on to say in uh, 538, um, you have said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and I decided I'm, I need to look that up. And yes, the Old Testament does say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but the context, what matters is the context um, it is appropriate punishment for false witnesses who were lying in a court for profit. People who have been brought in, conspirators, who are giving the lie that they were told to give in order to get somebody off or to get somebody else accused. There's a really famous story in the Old Testament about King Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab wants the orchard that belongs to an Israelite who lives in, in the city. And he goes to him and asks, can I buy it? Let me buy your, your orchard. And he said, I'm sorry. This is the land of my family's inheritance. I'm not allowed to sell this land. And that's true. You're not allowed to sell the land. So the king has him accused by false witnesses, hauled into court, they find him guilty, they kill him, and then the king takes his land. Today we call that eminent domain, don't we? I mean, it's people in power use that power inappropriately often. 
Um, but the idea is that if someone in court says something in order to cause intentional harm to someone else or intentionally lies for profit, um, then there is, uh, they need to make restitution by them receiving what they intended for this other person. So you wanted to put them in jail, you'll go in jail. You wanted them killed, you'll be killed. It's do unto others as you would have be done unto you, applied to them. And that's why it's an eye for an eye. If you intentionally take out somebody else's eye, we're taking yours. But that is not how the law of Moses dealt with unintended or accidental consequences. If you accidentally cause an accident, say you're cutting down a tree. I worry about this every time that we have somebody come over and help cut down a tree, or Randy goes to help somebody else cut down a tree. It's not that safe. Right? Especially if you have non-professionals doing it. And I remember once when our elder scrum was cutting down a tree, the log whipped around and cut somebody and he needed 27 stitches because he was in the wrong place at the wrong moment. They misjudged where the weight and mass of that tree was going to go. Um, if someone should accidentally lose their eye, because a branch whips around as you're cutting down that tree, you don't have to have your eye poked out. That's not the law of Moses. But if that makes him so he can no longer do his job or, or limits his ability to earn money for his family, then he has to be compensated. And this is where much of our legal system comes from, is the idea that, um, you know, it's not going to help that guy at all for you to lose your eye. What can you do to compensate in a, a realistic way? So it actually says that if the owner of a slave knocks out their tooth, a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, or pokes out his eye, the owner has to set that slave free, which would mean a whole lot more to that slave than the owner losing an eye or a tooth. Because um, how do you pay for that? How do you make up for that? And in this case, that's from Numbers 35, 9 to 30, where it also talks about, what about manslaughter? One of the most moving testimony meetings I'd ever been at was when a member of our congregation, who was a dad in the elders' Crown presidency, got up and said, I am so grateful for the atonement of Jesus Christ. As a teenager, I caused a traffic accident that killed three people. Now, I'd never known anybody who needed the atonement to cover murder. And it's not murder, right? It's an accident. But how do you forgive yourself? And one of the things that the Law of Moses did in that situation is if someone is accidentally killed under your watch or by you, um, the law was that they would, um, that the person who caused the death would have to leave the city that they were in or the family and friends of the person are that is now dead and move to, they're called cities of refuge. He's not in prison there. He's free to travel. He's just not free to walk the same streets and live next door to the family of the person he killed because that would be hard for them to see that other person free all the time. So as we judge the law of Moses, there are some aspects in it that I think it's important to look at where they're looking for how can we be fair to everybody involved? What would be a fair decision? 
um, and beautifully, um, where Matthew will say at the end of this section, be therefore perfect, Luke says, be therefore merciful, for my Father in heaven is merciful. Um, another way to say that, and this is from Eric Huntsman's translation of Luke, he said, show compassion as your Father in heaven has shown compassion. And I like that description of what Jesus is saying to people better than be perfect. I mean, we have such a problem with perfectionism. But mercy should be a, maybe a little easier. Um, the purpose of some of the judgments of the court under the law of Moses were, and I can give you scripture in verse on this, uh, Deuteronomy 19, verse 19, to eliminate evil out of a society. You can't just let evil keep happening. It's contagious. And that's very much uh, how the law speaks of evil and sin as sickness that is contagious. And so you have to separate it out from among the rest of you. You also need to discourage that action by other people. How do you do that? Well, we have found by sad experience that the, the capital punishment doesn't stop people from killing each other. When you have gang warfare, they have so little value on life itself that the threat of being killed won't stop them from killing someone else because they're already under the threat of being killed. It's hard to find actions that discourage evil. And third, you're to compensate the victim, even if it's only monetarily, there needs to be some compensation to the victim. And fourth, vengeance is not allowed. And that was, um, you know, the, the scriptures say, God says, vengeance is mine. It's not yours. I remember when they were putting out the third episode of Star Wars, the, I, actually the six, right? and they were going to name it Revenge of the Jedi. But somebody said, I'm sorry, Vengi the Jedi don't take revenge. That's one of the s hallmarks of a good person is they don't take revenge, and so they changed it to Return of the Jedi. Now, um, Jesus will say, it is, um, you have heard it said, and go through and talk about what other leaders, religious leaders, and people in the community, how they are interpreting the law of Moses. He's quoting what the Pharisees are saying, or what the Sadducees are saying. When Jesus wants to quote what the scriptures are, what God has said, he will say, have you not read? Is it not written? Again, it is written. Is it not written? And so he refers back to what's actually in writing rather than how you've heard it interpreted. And I wish more Mormons would do that. Instead of saying, well, I heard. And where did you hear that? And did you go back and check to see if that actually agrees with scripture? Because we tend to go with hearsay from a Sunday school teacher or something you heard at sacrament meeting. Even, I hope I can say this, even sometimes things that are said at general conference that may or may not be our doctrine, and we're in a 
position right now where the church is really struggling to define for its members what is doctrine, what is not. And they've done all those essays and put all kinds of things in writing on LDS.org, and people are still quoting Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon doctrine. Right? You have heard. Um, so, and that's exactly the language that Abinadi used in that court was, what is it that you are teaching versus what do the scriptures actually say? Okay, um, good. Uh, Jesus is not setting aside the Old Testament law in favor of a new teaching. He is setting aside new teachings in favor of the Word of God in writing. And so when people come along and say, oh, Jesus gives all higher law, you want to go back and say, have you read the Old Testament? Really? No, we don't. Okay, now, one of the um, Ten Commandments um, is thou shalt not commit adultery. And I think that we misunderstand what Jesus had to say about that one. Um, Jesus will say, let me see if I can find it here, how he interprets it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is verse 28 of chapter 5. But I say unto you, whoso looketh on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I'm going to use language speaking, using the same genders as Jesus uses here. But it is an equal opportunity sin. Okay? This isn't only men. But um, the word that is used to lust after is, um, do I have this on here? Yes, right here, is exactly the same word as covet. It means to desire or to want. Now, um, that word <laughs> is um, to desire, even sexual desire, is nowhere forbidden in scripture. There are no scriptures that indicate that people should not desire one another within marriage. But the question is, where does the desire lead? There's a phrase in the Greek, and the word is pros, which is in order to, for the purpose of, um, here's a couple of uses of it. Uh, beware of practicing your righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them. Jesus is not saying, don't be righteous in public. He's saying, don't be righteous in public for the purpose of making people think you're righteous, right? For show. Or um, gather up the tares and bind them in bundle, bundles in order to burn them up. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Here's another one. Um, they do these deeds in order to be noticed of men. They broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels for the purpose of being noticed. When she poured this perfume on me, she did it in order to prepare me for burial, for the purpose of, this is Mary in anointing Christ. So the, what, G, what, what the scripture actually says, what Jesus is saying is, don't look after someone to desire them for the purpose of 
having intercourse with them if it's outside of your acceptable limits. Keeping desire within the bounds the Lord has set. Anyone who looks at a woman in order to covet her, don't be coveting your neighbor's wife or your sister or that girl down the street. But it's perfectly fine to desire your own wife. And this, I think, is, is important. Um, Jesus does not say that the thought and the action are equivalent. In other words, he doesn't say that having desire is a sin. He's saying having a desire, concentrating on it, planning how to act in an unlawful way on that desire is the sin. Because once you start down that path, where is that leading? Once you start planning, how are you going to accomplish that? How are you going to satisfy that desire? Um, so our emphasis, especially with our youth, who struggle with how do I deal with these thoughts and feelings, adults continue to have that problem. Uh, the, the emphasis should not be on not having any sexual thoughts, not feeling any desires, because honestly, that's impossible. You're human. This is normal. The problem is, what is the appropriate response to those feelings? Concentrating on it, planning a way to fulfill that. So missionaries, um, <laughs> you're not, you're not going to be able to control every single thought while you're on your mission. And getting elders in particular, although sisters as well, to relax a little bit and accept themselves as human beings is difficult for presidents and for mission moms. The, the point is, don't be planning some way to go out on a date with that girl. We went to, uh, okay, Boston Red Sox, right? Boston Red Sox game at the Big Green Monster in Boston. Uh, and went and sat down in our seats, and one row ahead of us, about five seats over, were two missionaries who were in the same ward as our brother-in-law, who was from Boston, with two girl investigators. And he stepped over to them and said, excuse me, elders, what are you doing? Now, were they doing anything wrong? Well, it depends on who's saying what's wrong. The problem is it becomes a slippery slope. And planning ways to be alone with somebody, leaving your companion to go play music in a bar, which one of Randy's companions did, um, there's a lot of ways you can get yourself in trouble getting a job. Was that one of your companions, too, who went out and got a job? It, anyway, knew somebody. There's all kinds of ways you can think of to get in trouble on your mission where you're just going past the bonds, the bounds that your president has set. And the same thing is true in the rest of our lives. So uh, this is from... Uh, blog post by a guy named Jason Staples. I enjoy some of his stuff. He has a section called The Most Misinterpreted Bible Passages, and this is one of them. And he'll say, so what is the proper response to sexual desire? Desires are not sinful. The exercise of sexual appetite outside of appropriate boundaries is the problem. The point is that once your will has turned towards illicit behavior, Sin has entered your heart, and if you carry it through, then you're in trouble. 
So I hope we can keep that one in mind. Um, this is a quote from the Orthodox Study Bible that I have at home, which has been a nice contrast to the uh, often Catholic or other anti-physical body churches. You can, you, you can assess that Catholics are kind of anti-physical bodies, right? Let's mortify the flesh. Let's, the most holy people don't have sex. They don't eat a lot. They don't own anything, right? OK. So this is from an Orthodox study Bible. Their, minister, their, their priests, by the way, do marry and bishops. One who feasts upon lusts brings sin into his heart through his thoughts. Thoughts which enter the mind involuntarily may be temptations but they are not sins. They become sins only when they are held onto and entertained. I think that that's a great summary. OK. Um, so at, at the end, then, of chapter 5, be therefore perfect, um, I, I already have told you Luke in chapter 7 says, be therefore compassionate even as your Father in Heaven is compassionate, that reminded me of my favorite, one of my favorite poems. Um, it also is, a re this poem is a restatement of the golden rule, which is part of this sermon. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And uh, the poem is called Forgiveness Flower. It's by Marguerite Stewart. It is quoted in an article in BYU Religious Studies uh, back in 1993. I love this. When I went to the door at the whisper of knocking, I saw Simeon Ganter's daughter Kathleen standing there in her shawl and her shame, sent to ask Forgiveness flower for her bread. Forgiveness flower, we call it in our corner. If one has erred, one is sent to ask flower of his neighbors. If they loan it to him, that means he can stay. If they refuse, he'd best take himself off. I looked at Kathleen. What a jewel of a daughter, although not much like her father, more's the pity. I'll give you flour, I said, and I went to measure it. Measuring was the rub. If I gave too much, neighbors would think I made sin easy. But if I gave too little, they, will lab they would label me close. While I stood measuring, Joel, my husband, came in from the mill, a big bag of flour on his shoulder, and seeing her there, shrinking in the doorway, he dropped the bag at her feet. Here, take all of it. And so she had enough flour for lo many loaves while I stood measuring. I really like Joel. And it's hard not to judge and say, what's an appropriate amount? We always want others to receive, well, we don't always. We sometimes want others to receive the most punishment because they've really hurt us. But what we want from the Lord is the most mercy. Maybe we can consider that. OK, um, Gail Strathern, uh, or Gay Strathern, sorry, G-A-Y-E, who um, taught, I don't believe she's still there, at BYU, in talking about the life and teachings of Jesus, said, we usually stop the, the pericope of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, 7, and um, then go on. but. Um, the summary of this section 
is Matthew 11, 4 to 5. Let's go there. Starting chapter 11. It came to pass when Jesus made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, and that's what he's doing at the Sermon on the Mount, is teaching the 12 and others. He departed thence to teach and preach um, in their cities. And then uh, John's disciples come and ask, Art thou he that would come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said, verses 4 and 5, Go and show John those things which you do hear and see. The blind received their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Do you see how Jesus has combined five, six, seven, preaching to the poor, blessed are the poor are his opening words, with chapters eight and nine, which are the miracle chapters, the healings. And we tend to separate the two and talk a lot about how we need to keep the commandments and do all the things in the Sermon on the Mount, and then we don't look at eight and nine and assume that those are also obligations upon us. And yet, in writing it, Matthew implies um, this is all one piece. This is all the gospel is that healing. Now, um, Moses, when he was uh, receiving the Ten Commandments that Jesus quotes in the Sermon on the Mount, when, it's, when after he has received the commandments, it said, he went down from the mountain. And that's exactly the phrase used to describe when Jesus completes teaching the people. He went down from the mountain. And then he goes out and starts applying the principles. So that's suggesting, as I hope you're not, um, um, that this isn't hitting you over the head with a stick, but Matthew is very much comparing Jesus to Moses as the lawgiver, quoting the commandments, this is happening on a mountain, and then we forget what else comes up next that also comes from the law of Moses or from the life of Moses, and that is Moses' brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, accuse him of doing something wrong. They bring up the issue of the um, Ethiopian woman. And um, let me, let's, um, that's Numbers chapter 12, verse 11. But there was an earlier incident in Moses' life. This is Exodus chapter 4, verse 6, when he says, how do I know, Jehovah, that I've been called as a prophet and that I'm supposed to go out and do all of this? And one of the signs to Moses was that he would put his hand inside the bosom of his clothing, and when he brought it out, it would be covered in leprosy. Then he puts the hand back, and the leprosy is healed. When Aaron and Miriam complain unjustly against Moses, Miriam gets stricken with leprosy and has to spend a week outside of the camp. And a week is how long it takes to go through the ceremony of being forgiven by the priest at the temple for leprosy. Um, and Moses prays in her behalf, like the high priest. Let her not be as one dead. Heal her now, is what Moses asks. And so the very first thing that Jesus does when he comes down from the Sermon on the Mount is, um, let me see if I can find the, where it quotes it here. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter, that's why. I need to go to eight. There's a whole series that come up here and it's, it's beautiful, I love it. Um, when he was come down from the mountain, the multitude followed him. And behold, 
there was a leper who came, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And the leprosy was cleansed. Jesus said, tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them, a witness again. Um, okay. So as we get into this curing leprosy, we forget that that was also a part of making, showing how Jesus is like Moses. And that people with leprosy can be cleansed through the temple and, and from the high priest. In um, Numbers chapter 12, where it talks about Miriam, it says, and she was healed. And the word for healed, I didn't write it down, sorry. Make sure I get the right H at the end. Okay, is um, Rafa, R, P, not B, <clears throat> sorry, P, H, A. Rafa, like, Raphael, okay? That name of one of the archangels is Raphael, which means a healer, one who heals. Um, I hope that you look at the, these traditional names for the angels, which during the, and after the Babylonian captivity become weird. They've, they've taken the Persian ideas of semi-divine beings with wings and applied that to the concept that God has people working for him. Now, in the past, uh, before the Babylonian captivity, every time it says angel in the text, it's the Hebrew malak, which means messenger. And there that same word is used for both individuals sent as physical messengers from a king and these individuals sent by God with a message. And there's nothing to indicate that they have wings or any of, any of the rest. But by the time of Jesus, you've already got this whole pantheon of semi-divine beings Michael, who is like God. Um, Daniel, a God of, who judges. Um, Gabriel, mighty man or mighty warrior of God. Raphael, a healer of God. Or God heals. So we're going to watch God heal. Um, now, in the Talmud, it will say that curing leprosy is as difficult as raising the dead. That's a commentary on that verse about Miriam, let her not be as one dead. Because leprosy, since it had no cure in antiquity, um, was a death sentence. And living death. It's not like you get cancer or tuberculosis and in a couple of months you're gone. Instead, it's years of pain and horror as your body falls apart. Quite literally, pieces fall off. Um, so, curing leprosy is the first of these miracles. Um, you'll often see people who are sick who ask to be healed, and Jesus will then say, your sins are forgiven. And so there are many cultures, including the New Testament culture, what sin did this man or his parents commit that he was born blind that connect <clears throat> any kind of deformity or birth 
defect of any kind or sickness or tragedy as being payment for sin. I mean, that's exactly what um, Job's friends will say to him. What did you do wrong that this earthquake knocked your barn down and killed your kids? You must have done something wrong. And unfortunately, we still have this idea in the back of our minds. I've tried to keep every commandment. I've done everything I was ever asked. Why should I get cancer? I didn't smoke. Why should I get lung cancer? And we develop an anger with God for treating us badly. Um, Jesus is trying to say there is no connection. Neither did this man sin, nor his parents. And so as he heals people, he will say, which is harder? To say, um, your sins are forgiven, or saying to the lame man, arise and walk, and have the man get up and walk. Now, no one can actually see whether or not your sins are forgiven. You might feel it yourself. But seeing someone who's been lame for years get up and walk, that's pretty spectacular. Jesus did not do that kind of healing just to heal. He did it in order to show that he had power to forgive, which is the more important power. So as we look at these healing stories, we should think about what is the more important end result, and that is the healing. Um, now, it has Jesus reaching out his hand and touching him. That's an interesting word. Um, that's naga, which means to touch. But it is also the verb describing how you get leprosy, that you are afflicted, naga, that you are stricken with leprosy, which is tsara. So I find it fascinating that the same verb works both for how the individual contracted leprosy, probably through touching something, and how he is cured by Jesus touching him. Now, there's a, a lot of debate goes on about whether or not Jesus was following the law of Moses in touching a leper. Some people will interpret the law and say, if you're unclean, and a leper is unclean, which means you are not allowed within the um, um, area of the temple. Anything that is unclean cannot come into the temple. But many times when things are declared unclean, anyone who touches it, like a dead body, is unclean. Anyone who touches that dead body acquires that uncleanliness themselves, they need to go to the mikvah, wash off, wait a week, and then they can rejoin the community. Um, it's not really specific about what happens if you touch a leper. 